Okay, so tonight we're going to do something a little bit on the fun side. Uh, well, I think it's fun. If you don't, um, I'm sorry, but um, I think this is a lot of fun. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to have a brief overview from the book of Joshua. And then we're just going to look at lessons that is taught in the words of Joshua. So um, we all kind of are familiar with the story of Joshua, um, a new elected leader of Israel that had to then take Israel into the promised land. And of course, we are very familiar with Joshua and the Battle of Jericho. But there might be a few key lessons that we kind of skipped over because we know the Sunday school story. Um, but the question is, how many of us actually know the full story of Joshua? Now, first of all, disclaimer, I'm not claiming that I know the full story, but uh, hopefully there will be some wisdoms and insights tonight that are unique. So, Without further ado, let's have a look at the book of Joshua. So firstly, we're going to look at the first five chapters of Joshua. And don't worry, this is not a verse by verse expedition. Um, this is a very brief overview in the 24 chapters of the book of Joshua. So we start off in chapter one with the death of Moses and how Joshua was then appointed to be the new leader of Israel. Then we are introduced to God's promise to Joshua, and we are quite familiar with that promise because we've um, we sing hymns on a hopefully a weekly basis about it, where we say, "Be bold, be strong, for the Lord your God is with you." It's the promise that God has got, uh, given Joshua that. He will be with him and that he must be bold and courageous because God is going to be with him in all that is going to happen to him. So um, just to remind us, it's in Joshua 1 from verse 6 to verse 9. He says, and this is now God speaking to Joshua, be strong and courageous for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the left or the right. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study, the book, uh, study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do this is my command be strong and courageous do not be afraid or discouraged for the lord your god is with you wherever you go okay. so this is coming from the nlt translation um so there we have it. Joshua is then instructed by God and reminded of the instructions that he received from Moses. And then he is reminding Joshua of the promise of the, uh, um, the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then, of course, to heed um, to all of the instructions as said, but then to also encourage him to be bold and courageous. So Joshua then sends out the spies into um, the land of Canaan, and they then go into the city of Jericho to do a reconnaissance. And of course, then they meet Rahab and all that is involved with that. So the story of Rahab and the spies we can find in chapter two. So in chapter three, Israel then crosses the Jordan River. And after they've crossed, the Jordan, they had to do some rituals that was given to them. Well, I say rituals, but it's actually more uh, instructions and very important instructions that they have to do. And one of these is the 12 memorial stones that they had to set up and then write the 
words of the book of instruction on them, um, which we will find in chapter four. And then a whole new generation of Israel's Israelites is then um, circumcised in the land of Canaan, along with the first Passover that they have. And then we have that very um, popular, if that's the right word, scene where Joshua then meets the commander of the Lord's army and is then given the instructions on how to tackle the city of Jericho. Carrying on in the next six chapters, um, Joshua then gets these instructions from God of how he must then prepare for the battle of Jericho. So for those who do know, and for those who don't, I'll just quickly remind us that they had to then walk in silence around the city of Jericho. When they completed their walk, they had to blow on the ram's horns. And then, of course, on the seventh day, they had to walk seven times in silence. And then the, after the ram's horns blew, they shouted, and the whole city came tumbling down, except for the wall in which Rachel uh, Rahab was staying. Okay, so continuing into chapter six, we have the fall of Jericho. And not just the fall of Jericho, but instructions regarding the spoils of the battle. Now, I'm just quickly going to highlight this because this is important for a little bit later. Okay, so in Joshua 6 verse 18, God says to Israel, do not take any of the things set apart for destruction or you yourselves will be completely destroyed and you will bring trouble on the camp of Israel. Everything made from silver, gold, bronze or iron is sacred to the Lord and must be brought into his treasury. When the people heard the sound of the ram's horns, they shouted aloud as they could and suddenly the walls of Jericho collapsed and the Israelites charged straight into the city and captured it. They completely destroyed everything in it with their swords, men, women, young and old, cattle, sheep, donkeys and goats, Okay, as they were instructed. So, following on that, we are then introduced to a man called Achan and the sin that he committed within the first couple of hours of getting the instructions. So Achan then stole from the spoils of Jericho, um, as in chapter 7, but Israel violated the instructions um, that was about the things set apart for the Lord. A man named Achan had stolen some of these dedicated things, so the Lord was very angry with the Israelites. Achan was the son of Camri, the descendant of Zimri, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah. Okay, so we were just in chapter six when God said, do not take any of that for yourself. And literally in the first verse, we read of Achan that did not listen. So Joshua is then fighting the battle of Ai, and he loses that because of Achan's sin. So God then identifies the reason why Israel lost this battle. And then we have that scene of the whole uh, nation of Israel standing in front of uh, Joshua and the Ark of Covenant. And then God takes away the 11 tribes, leaving just the tribe of Judah. And then they go down all the way to the family of Zimri and then identify Achan as the culprit. Then we read of Achan's punishment, of how he, his wife, his children, his belongings, and the stuff that he was stolen was then destroyed. And then on that follows chapter 8, when Joshua then again takes the uh, on the battle of Ai. Um, this is with God's instruction, and God tells him that he will now give them victory in the city of Ai. And then Joshua renews the covenants of Moses with Israel. All right. So chapter nine, we are then in uh, uh, reminded of the story of the Gibeonites, how they then deceived uh, Israel and Joshua, and also how Joshua and the Israelites made a crucial mistake with not consulting God. 
And then basically from chapters 10 onwards, uh, we then have recollections of all of the battles that happen after that. So we have the battles against the Amorites and then the Hittites, and we have the conquest of Southern Canaan, the conquest of the uh, Northern parts of Canaan, and then a summary at the end of um, all of this in chapter 12, where it first lists all of the battles that Moses led the Israelites and their conquests there, and then a summary of the battles that Joshua led and all of the conquests there. So then chapters 13 to 22 is kind of seen as quote unquote, the boring chapters of the book of Joshua, because now Joshua is dividing the land of Canaan into the tribes of Israel. And he's giving instructions of where Benjamin and Levi and Dan and Judah and all of them are allocated land. Okay, so it's very, very boring to read if um, you go through it because it's just stats and numbers and sizes. But to the Israelites back then, this was very important because this was then now when they now basically saw the fulfillment of the promises. And then in chapters 23 and 24, we have then this final epilogue from Joshua where he then speaks to the tribe of Israel. Um, he gives them the final commandments and instructions. And then in chapter 24, he then also reminds them of the promises of God. And then eventually um, he tells them that they now need to choose between God and a, uh, other deities or idols. And then the book of Joshua is then wrapped up with a neat little bow um, that concludes with the death of Joshua. And then that is the end. So what is the actual lessons that we can read or learn from the book of Joshua? So when we look at these first five chapters, The first five chapters serve as an actual reminder of God's promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as I mentioned a little bit earlier. So it looks back to the past, but then it also deals with the present to remind Israel of the instructions that they were given by Moses and of what needs to be done when Israel enters the promised land. So they're still being reminded of things that they were told. And then it also deals with the future. And that is then the instructions with regarding to the battles of Jericho. So it deals with the past of Israel, the present at that time of Israel, and the future of what is to come regarding their battles. Okay. So we can see in Deuteronomy 27, um, uh, that is when Moses is then given the instructions of what needs to happen when they cross the Jordan River. And one of those instructions is, like I said earlier, a very important one, the 12 memorial stones. So let's quickly have a look at Deuteronomy 27, verses 1 to 8. So still in the NLT, it reads, then Moses and the leaders of Israel gave this charge to the people. Obey all these commands that I am giving to you today. When you cross the Jordan River and enter the land the Lord your God is giving to you, set up some large stones and coat them with plaster. Write this whole body of instruction on them when you cross the river to enter the land of the Lord. Uh, sorry, to ent enter the land the Lord your God is giving you a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. When you cross the Jordan, set up these stones at Mount Ebal and coat them with plaster, as I'm commanding you today. Then build an altar there to the Lord your God, using natural uncut stones. You must not shape the stones with an iron tool. 
build an altar of uncut stones and use it to offer burnt offerings to the Lord your God. Also sacrifice peace offerings on it and celebrate by feasting there before the Lord your God. You must clearly write all these instructions on the stones coated with plaster. So we can see uh, clearly see Israel in chapter three and four doing exactly that. As the Jordan River dries up, they then cross it. And the moment that they back on quote unquote dry land, they then built this altar. And it also reads in chapter four that it is to write down all of these instructions, but to remind generations that is still to come of the day that God dried up the Jordan River for Israel to cross. And then um, we also see the reason why um, Joshua needs to be going into the land of Canaan and why these battles are necessary. And I'm going to refer you to Deuteronomy chapter 7 and to chapter 12. So let's have a look first at what is the instructions that God gives Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 7. So Deuteronomy 7 verses 1 to 6, it says here, when the Lord your God brings you into the land you are about to enter and occupy, he will clear away many nations ahead of you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and Jebusites. These seven nations are greater and more numerous than you. When the Lord your God hands these nations over to you and you conquer them, you must completely destroy them, make no treaties with them, and show them no mercy. You must not intermarry with them. Do not let your daughters or sons or their sons and daughters marry. <clears throat> Sorry. Do not let your daughters and sons marry their sons and daughters. For they will lead your children away from me to worship other gods. Then the anger of the Lord will burn against you and he will quickly destroy you. This is what you must do. You must break down their pagan altars and shatter their sacred pillars. Cut down their Asherah, um, Asherah poles and burn their idols. For you are a holy people who belong to the Lord your God. Of all the people on earth, the Lord your God has chosen you to be his own special treasure. Okay, so we are reminded in the instructions um, given to Joshua that they need to then destroy these enemy tribes, quote unquote enemy, because of their um, idol worships and their different deities and their different cultures. One of these, that God detests is of child sacrifice. And that we see in chapter 12, um, verses 29 to 32. It says here, when the Lord your God goes ahead of you and uh, destroys the nations and drive them out, of, uh, out and live in their land, do not fall into the trap of uh, following their customs and worshiping their gods. Do not inquire about their gods saying, how do these nations worship their gods? I want to follow their example. You must not worship uh, <clears throat> the Lord your God the way other nations worship their gods. For they perform for their gods every despicable, uh, every despicable act that the Lord hates. They even burn their sons and daughters as sacrifices to their gods. So be careful to obey all the commandments I give you. You must not add anything to them or subtract anything from them. Okay, so we've now got the clear picture why these battles are so important, why they need to take down Jericho, why they need to attack Ai, why they need to go and uh, uh, attack the, um, the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites. So, in the following two chapters, we then have an example of God's faithfulness, okay? And it's actually very sad <laughs> because if we look at Exodus 23 and Exodus 33, 
Israel would have had it so much better if they were not um, so afraid when Moses was going to lead them into the promised land. When they tore their clothes because they heard that the land of Canaan is filled with giants. When the 12 spies returned with Joshua and Caleb. Let's just quickly have a look how good they could have had it. In Exodus 23, listen to what God tells Moses. He says, I will send my fear before thee and will destroy all the nations to whom thou shalt come. And I shall make them, uh, I'm sorry, I shall make all thine enemies turn their backs unto thee. And I shall send hornets before thee, which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite from before thee. I will not drive them out from before thee in one year, year lest the land become desolate and the beast of the field multiply against thee. All right. So God would have actually drive them out with natural forces and no battles would have been necessary. In chapter 33, God uses a different example. He says to Moses, get going, you and the people you brought up from the land of Egypt. Go up to the land I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I told them, I will give this land to your ancestors and I will send an angel before you to drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. So God was already faithful to them before they got to the, uh, to the Jordan River. And he has set up this whole idea of he's going to clear out the land and Israel is going to walk in there in peace. But because they doubted and they tore their clothes in lament, God then decided they can do it themselves. But then we see God's faithfulness in um, how he says then to Joshua, be courageous and be bold because I will be with you. And Joshua and the tribe of Israel walked around the city and it collapsed and God gave them victory. But then we're also reminded of Israel's failure of how they broke that single commandment that God gave them and said, do not take anything. I'll just quickly remind you again. It says in verse 18, do not take anything of the thing set apart for destruction for you yourselves will be completely destroyed and you will bring trouble on the camp of Israel. So, oops. So <laughs> Israel already failed. But then God shows them that he will not stop for the smallest thing. I mean, if you go and look at the story of Achan, he took three things. He took a little bit of gold, a little bit of silver, and a cloak. And therefore, his whole family was destroyed because that God had to make sure that this evil seed does not proceed any further. So God showed that no trespass will go unseen. So um, when we look then at the battles of uh, Joshua, we see then the fulfillment of God's promise to him, of how they then conquered the Amorites and the, the south of Canaan and the north of Canaan, and how God has delivered all of the enemies in their hands. And we then are given this list of how God then gives them the land of Canaan. But then we're also seeing what happens when they don't consult God because they were supposed to destroy the Gibeonites. But then in, uh, later we learned that they had to then enslave them because they made a promise before God. Once again, that small little detail that God said, do not even make a treaty with these people. Israel could not even stay to those laws. But so God still delivered the enemies into their hands and given them great success in their conquests. So they were then, um, we see the fulfillment of God's promise, but we also see then God's justice um, 
displayed uh well it, it it just displays how god's justice is exercised then on mankind's evil tendencies of how all these shrines have been then been destroyed so i also just want to in a second breath say that these were not complete genocides they just destroyed the cities and most of these people then were kind of like okay this is the god of israel and we will now follow the God of Israel because if we read later in the book of Judges, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, all of them are still there, but now they have been shown that God is the only one true God. It's just all of the unnecessary evils have been removed. Then, lastly, with the last nine chapters or more um once again we didn't see the division of the land of canaan so joshua then consults god and god gives through these instructions i'm not going to go into a length of detail with that um all that i would say is that is a very interesting read um for yourselves to do so i would implore you to do so and then um i just want to mention two or three lessons that we can then take from the final words of Joshua. So, as I said um, earlier, well, I don't actually say it, so let me say it now. So, in these last two chapters, Joshua then reminds Israel of God's faithfulness and then how God has blessed them with this land of Canaan. Um, if we look in verse 20 uh, in chapter 24 verse 13 god says to them i gave you the land that you had not worked on i gave you the towns that you did not build the towns where you are now living i gave you vineyards with olive groves for food though you did not plant them okay so this is now in that very chapter of where joshua confronts israel and say to them you must choose your god now who are you going to serve so it reminds Israel of God's faithfulness and, of course, implore them to trust God. But it is not just a romantic ending. He also goes on to warn Israel what would happen if they were to then turn their backs on God. And he then says that God will execute his divine justice and we find that in verses 19 and 20 um, which i coincidentally did not leave here but god says there that um well joshua with through god's instruction then tells israel that if you cho uh, choose not to serve the lord your god that he will then destroy you and of course we can see this later in the book of Judges and book of Chronicles and all the way up to Israel being exiled into Babylon. So, dear brothers and sisters, that is um, a full summary, a short summary of um, the book of Joshua. But just once again, the key principles that we can see in the book of Joshua is then, of course, how God fulfills his promise of taking Israel into the promised land, how he continues to remind Israel to follow the instructions that he has given them, because if they follow it to the word, like he said um, in the book of Deuteronomy, if they do not add or subtract, told Joshua not to go left or right, then he will basically pave the way ahead of them. And we can see all of these battles as a good reminder of how God then keeps his promises and then, of course, the statutes that he delivers to them as a final word in the book of Joshua of how they then must live. And, of course, the, this looming warning that if they should not follow, then they will be punished. So I'm going to open up the floor now for discussion. Um, but I'm going to be doing it with the rest of the group in the living rooms.